the program is, is called First Blood. It's on, based on a book by W.A. Swanberg. It's a 1958 book. It's a great read if you have uh, the opportunity to, to get it, if it's still in the library. Uh, it's a big, long book. It's almost 400 pages. It's very hard to do a program on a 400-page book because there are so many highlights. There's so many people involved. There's so much dissent in Washington with all the senators and secretaries of war, state, treasury, that were all under the South. And then they were trying to get all the information from the North and send it down to the South on what was happening. So there's a lot of devious stuff that went on. So we will get into some of it. We're going to start, the program starts in the 1860s, early 1860s, like 1860. That's when the program starts. Um, Fort Sumter sits in the harbor of Charleston, South Carolina. Um, there were four forts at the time. There was Fort Moultrie, which is where the soldiers were stationed at the time. There was Fort Sumter, which sat in the middle of the channel. There was Fort Pickney and Fort Johnson, four forts that the United States government owned. To give you a little rundown on where we're at, uh, Fort Johnson was an old Revolutionary War fort that was abandoned. So it was there, but it wasn't active. Uh, fort Pickney, I think, had one cannon. And I'll, I'll get into detail on it, but I believe there was one, one or two cannons there with a guy and his wife stationed there just to clean them, oil them, and keep them from rusting. So they weren't really being used. All right, so we'll start in September of 1860. This is before the presidential elections. So if we hit the first slide, Dr. Samuel Wiley Crawford. He's a surgeon uh, for the Union, and he is from Pennsylvania. Uh, he was assigned to go to Fort Moultrie. He arrived in Charleston by train, and then he took a steamer ship out to the fort. It was commanded by a 70-year-old lieutenant colonel, John Lane Gardner, who was, I guess, a Union officer, but loved the South because he was living very, very luxurious at the time. Uh, there were two company commanders, Captain Truman Seymour, and a name that everybody here should know, Captain Abner Doubleday. All right, and if you don't know it, I will explain to you who he is. There's a total of 61 soldiers and 13 musicians. They had their own band, so that was uh, the reason for the musicians. They must have done a lot of parading and stuff in the town, but they didn't do anything else. Um, all right, uh, Gardner, let's see, the fort that they were in, Moultrie, was uh, just off of a street. So you had a, a street going down the road and Moultrie sat below it. So you could actually look over the fort from the street. So you can picture like trying to defend a fort when the people on the street can stand there and shoot at you from the street. So that'll get explained a little farther down, but Doubleday, he was not real happy about being there at all. Uh, he was not happy because he was, first of all, because he was second in command. And it was an old rundown fort across the street from shops and houses where a sniper could pick off soldiers at will. And with the recent upheaval and talk of secession, and taking the fort back from the Yankee government. He, I think he at one time said, cows come into our fort, how could we hold out people that wanted to invade us? Um, young South Carolina representative Lawrence Kite said, if the Republican Lincoln was elected, loyal to the North, loyalty to the North would be treason to the South. Now Gardner, who was the, in charge of the fort, he lived off the post in a house lived comfortably and dined with the high society, he leaned toward the South and called Lincoln an uncouth backwoodsman. A few days later, uh, we'll switch the picture now, clip that. 
A few days later, Captain John Gray Foster. You like the mutton chops on there? He was from New Hampshire. He arrived to survey the work that had to be done to improve the fort and to complete the then unfinished Fort Sumter. He opened an office in Charleston. He hired workers to start repairs. Most Carolina leaders decided the state was going to secede and, and as soon as Lincoln took office and would not allow the Union uh, forces in its heart, to keep Union forces in its harbor. For over 30 years they talked of secession. The Union controlled four forts in the harbor, which are the ones I mentioned, Castle Pickney, that was on Schutz Folly Island. It contained some heavy guns, was occupied by the Ordnance Sergeant, Sergeant Skillen and his family. His duty was to just keep the equipment lacquered and oiled against rust in case it was needed. Fort Johnson across the bay was an old revolutionary fort that was abandoned and in ruin. Fort Moultrie was the one that they were using at the time. It was an empty, unfinished Oh, the next, next line. Empty, unfinished <laughs> Fort Sumter was out in the bay. In 1829, the government spent a half a million dollars to put a granite base out in the harbor uh, to put Fort Sumter on. So you imagine a half a million dollars in 1829. It would be like 10 million or 20 million today. Uh, Roughly, in later years, they spent roughly another half a million dollars to build a foundation. It was designed to be the most powerful in the nation, with a garrison of 650 men, 140 cannons. But because we were in peacetime after the War of 1812, nothing else was done to it. They built the foundation, and that was it. Um, the Carolinans knew that they needed the fort, because they needed to stop the shipping coming into the harbor because they relied on commerce coming from Europe, from other parts of the south and coming up into the Charleston Harbor. So they know they needed the fort. They couldn't let the north get the fort and stop their shipping from coming in. So uh, now we're going to the next picture, uh, which is Robert Barnes Brett. Uh, Robert Burnside read, I think it is, Burnwell. He despised the, the North and the government, and for 30 years he pushed for secession. He owned two plantations, 190 slaves, and he owned the local newspaper, which is the Mercury. Uh, there's a picture of the, Mer the uh, an article in the Mercury in this book right here. Uh, the Mercury posted if Lincoln is elected, the Union will be dissolved. And they had a picture of the new flag that they, they were going to fly. It was, of course, everything down south was, if you see the South Carolina license plates, you see the palmetto tree. So that was their flag. South Carolina was the palmetto flag. Uh, okay, so. Let's see, oh, he, for, for 30 years he pushed for secession. He owned 190 slaves, a newspaper, the Mercury, where he spread lots of rumors and riled up all the citizens. On November 5th of 1860, Governor William Henry Gist, he urged a thorough reorganization of the state's militia, calling for every man between 18 and 45 to volunteer and build up the troops to 10,000 men. Two weeks earlier, he sent an agent to Washington to negotiate with the Secretary of War, John Floyd. Next picture is John Floyd. This guy was the most devious thief, lying person in Washington. Um, he was the actual Secretary of War under the President Buchanan, who was a, we'll get into it later, but he was a South leading leaning Democrat from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So he was, he was in from the North, but he was supported by the South completely. Uh, he went there for, to, to purchase arms. Floyd, who was a Virginian, he approved 10,000 muskets at $2 each. U.S. Senator James <coughs> Chestnut used the term black Republicans for the people in the North because the North was predominantly Republican and anti-slavery and supported the freeing of the black slaves. 
while the South was predominantly plantation and slavery owning Democrats from the South. Chestnut alone owned one half dozen plantations and thousands of slaves. With all the talk about taking the forts back, Gardner requested reinforcements from Secretary Floyd. Of course, he was refused because Secretary Floyd was, he was from Virginia. He didn't want to see anybody come in there and raise up uh, the arms against their people and be able to hold that fort. After pressure, he agreed to allow them to go. Uh, no, this, we're moving ahead too fast. That's why I hate reading a, pro a program. I like to just remember it and give it, but this was too long to do. Seymour and Doubleday urged Gardner to get more arms from the government arsenal in Charleston, which was owned by the Union, but he was fearful that this would alarm the military, the, the militia of Carolina, and cause an uprising. After a lot of pressure from the men, he agreed to allow them to go undercover, out of uniform, at night to acquire what they needed. They went to the arsenal, and as they were leaving the arsenal, to lo loading up the boats, a man at the wharf stopped them, alarmed others, and a crowd gathered, forcing them to return all that they had in their hands, not what was in the boat. Um, congressmen from the southern states started resigning from their positions. There was talk about dividing the country into four separate confederacies. Lieutenant General Winfield Scott proposed garrisoning all nine southern forts. There were nine forts south of uh, Washington, D.C. to keep them from being overrun. Pre next picture, please. President Buchanan, oh, we're going into Anderson already, okay. This is, I'll leave that up there. President Buchanan asked, how many men do we have? The answer was approximately 400. So how are you gonna support nine forts in the south and reinforce Fort Sumter with 400 men. Most of the army was off, out west fighting Indians. Buchanan refused to re refused the reinforcements, but he uh, was afraid it was gonna infl inflame the people in the south. He wanted to pacify them, hoping everything would stay calm until he left office and returned to Lancaster and let Lincoln handle it. As things changed in, in Charleston, and they continued to heat up, Secretary Floyd decided to replace Gardner, who was requesting reinforcements uh, and with arms and ammo. He decided on Robert Anderson. He was from Kentucky. He was a pro-slave, south-leaning friend of Mississippi Senator Jefferson Davis. Floyd sent Gardner, think, uh, he figured he'd gone to get rid of him. He sent him out to Texas, away from Washington, to get him out of the way because he was requesting too much. Figured Gardner would be his perfect guy because he had, he was slave leaning, Kentucky, loved the South. He thought he would be the guy that would go down there and just pacify everybody. There'd be no battles, no fighting, no reinforcements. He wouldn't request anything because he was more leaning towards their side. Anderson assessed the situation at all four forts and immediately requested for supplies and reinforcements. Six times he requested reinforcements, six times supplies. All were denied by Secretary uh, of the War Floyd. The Assistant Secretary of State, William Henry Trescott, he was a wealthy member of the ruling class of South Carolina, acted as a spy for the South, staying close to Buchanan's side, listening to all the developments and reporting to the South. There was a whole bunch of spies. He was just one of the main ones. He did all he could to remove Anderson or keep his hands tied so that he could not defend the fort. Trescott confided in Howell Cobb, Secretary of the Treasury, Jacob Thompson, Secretary of the Interior, both were Southern secessionists, to help him push Floyd and to not send anything to Moultrie or Sumter. Uh, let's see. South Carolina in 1860 was very prosperous with cotton at 12 and a half cents a bale and Negro slaves selling for as high as $1,500 a piece. Now that was <coughs> the wealthy people were prosperous. The rest of the people in the South that didn't own slaves were not prosperous at all. They had nothing. They had their own little 
houses and little cabins and little tiny little farms. They didn't have slaves, couldn't afford slaves. So they were just they were really poor people in the South. While the North was very prosperous, industrialist, um, big cities. So there was a big difference between the North and the South. A lot of people think the Civil War is all about slavery, but it was a, as much about states' rights to a lot of people as it was slavery, because the government pretty much told them what they could do, what they couldn't do, and it's a lot like what's going on today in our country, and Texas was a South um, state back then, and Texas is now still a South state, but it's not happy with our government. So the same things are happening now that were happening back in 1860. Um, Let's see. Uh, they insisted to Buchanan that doing so would incite war. They did not want to supply this fort at all. Buchanan leaned towards the South and slavery because that was where his base was. That's who elected him. But he refused to vacate the forts in the South as they were government property and it was, he was still President of the United States. On December 20th, the Ordinance of Secession was unanimously passed and South Carolina dissolved itself of the Union. Now, uh, Governor Pickens, he seceded Governor Gist. So he took over um, after Gist in the same year. He came in right at the end of 1860. He decided the Union should va vacate the fort and turn over them all over to Carolina. Trescott and Floyd assured Pickens that Anderson would not fortify Sumter or receive supplies or reinforcements. Pickens directed Captain Charles Simonton to man two boats in the channel and if Anderson tried to move to Sumter, he was to repel him and also to let them know of any ships coming into the harbor. Meanwhile, Doubleday was outraged and pushed for Anderson to take the better defensive position at Fort Sumter and abandon all other outposts. Anderson was stuck in the middle. Um, he was uh, didn't want to stay in Moultrie because he knew it could be easily defeated, and he didn't know if he should move to Sumter because he wasn't ordered to do so, and he thought he might provoke a war. So Anderson decided on the evening of Christmas Day in 1860 that he would sneak out and move his men to Fort Sumter, where they would have a better defensive position. Uh, kept his plan for himself, never told anybody about it, but it rained all night, Christmas night, 1860. So he couldn't make the move because he had women and children and, and men and everything else, so he didn't want to do it. So he waited till the next mo morning. He sent all the women and children out of Moultrie and into the city to live wherever they could live with whoever they knew or get on trains and head back north. And then uh, he didn't tell his men until they were gone and the last minute finally told Doubleday to secure the flag and march his men down the street to a hidden cove and he loaded three boats for the trip across to Fort Sumter. He left seven men at Moultrie to cover his move and to protect him in case the Carolina boats in the harbor fired on them. Safely across, he ordered all the cannons destroyed at Moultrie and the ammunition brought over with the last boat. All right, then Buchanan, hearing of the situation, ordered Anderson to, to uh, protect Fort Sumter and if provoked by the, the militia, to not fire unless fired upon. Um, let's see, a report was sent to Washington, not reaching it until the 29th of December, and Governor Pickens, hearing of the move, sent an envoy to Sumter demanding the return of the men back to the Fort Moultrie. Anderson re replied no, the safety of his men would be better served at Sumter, and the government immediately ordered three companies of militia to Pickney Island and occupy it. This, by Anderson's view, was an aggression, aggression of war as this was the government property. Anderson sent a telegraph to Floyd at the War Department stating that if the militia attacked him, his men would have been sacrificed and that he spiked the guns and destroyed the, car the carriages at the Fort Moultrie to keep them from being used against us. Buchanan was surprised by the move and he thought it to be a nightmare. Floyd and Trescott, 
They were outraged because they had assured Pickens that nothing would change at Moultrie. Newspapers in the, in the North called Anderson a hero. Buchanan now, with pressure from Southern Democrats who elected him, fought with ideas of ordering return of, to Moultrie or abandoning the Charleston Harbor altogether. In Washington, there was praise for Buchanan and Anderson <coughs> thinking that he had ordered it. There were parades and marches in the streets in Philadelphia, New York, and Washington. Uh, Georgia Senator Toombs called on the pre president to make a decision now to return or evacuate because the cause of Charleston was the cause of the South. Buchan Buchanan replied, do you mean I am in the midst of a revolution? Yes, sir, said Toombs. You have been there for a year and just have not yet found it out. So he was already in, pro in, in having problems. Now, next slide. I'm hoping is the right one. Okay, that's, there's President Buchanan. That's what he looked like at the time. Gray-haired, that's a younger looking Buchanan. Um, that's a little bit earlier, I think, than 1860. All right, so now we're going to jump over to the next slide, which should be Jeremiah Black. Uh, that's Trescott. All right, so we're, getting, we're ahead of ourselves. That's Trescott, he's one of the guys, he was the Secretary of the Interior uh, under Buchanan, and he was in cahoots with Floyd to try to make sure that nothing was reinforced in South Carolina at all in any of the forts. Now, Jeremiah Black is a fellow Republican Democrat, but a, and a supporter of Old Buck, the Buchanan, the president, but he was outraged at the thought of deserting the fort, pleaded for supplies and reinforcements, because he, he was a, Unionist, but he was a Southern voting Democrat from Northern Pennsylvania, but he was leaning towards the Union. He supported the Union all the time. He threatened to quit as the uh, Secretary of State, of State. Lieutenant General Scott and Northern Senators begged the President to send two ships with men and supplies immediately to Fort Sumter. The thief and traitor Floyd telegraphed General Bonham of the South Carolina militia to cut off supplies and take Sumter as soon as possible. Scott sent an order to Fort Monroe, New York to ready four companies to depart on a 25-gun sloop called the Brooklyn to aid Sumter. Buchanan still wished for Anderson to return to Moultrie, but when he was told that the Carolina militia had taken positions of uh, Pickney, Moultrie, and Johnson, the Arsenal, the Custom House, and the Post Office, he was outraged. At the President's New Year's reception in New York, those from the South insulted him by refusing to shake hands or talk to him. After days of negotiation with the Southern Commission, a change was made to send a merchant ship, the Star of the West, with supplies only to Sumter so that they wouldn't cause a, a, a war by bringing a man of war ship there. So they, got, they hired a merchant ship and they took men and held up, kept them in the hold and just brought reinforcements of food and supplies to them. And Buchanan said if it's fired upon, it'll be fired upon a, a ship of bread. So he didn't want to uh, enrage the people in the South. Anderson watched as the Palmetto troops occupied the old Fort Johnson, Fort Moultrie, uh, Pickney. He was divide, denied position, provisions from Charleston. The militia seized the arsenal and its 22,000 muskets, cannons, and large quantity of ammunition. Governor Pickens thought Sumter was stronger and more well defended, delaying his attacking it though. He thought there were more people there and better weapons and everything. On December 29th, 40 cadets and a battery of 24-pound cannons and 90 infantry set up on Morris Island to stop ships from entering the channel. January 7th, Buchanan and General Scott sent the Brooklyn under Captain David Farragut. Uh, put that from Buchanan is there from Trescott, see who comes up next. Okay, that's Thompson, he's another one of their um, secretaries. That's where we're at now. Uh, the Star of the West was outside of the harbor, but due to darkness, he didn't did not attempt to enter the to the uh, 
harbor at all. He just stayed outside of it. Um, from Interior Secretary Thompson and Senator Wigfall, I think we have a picture of him too. He might be the next one, I hope. No, that's Pickens. He's the governor. The pic pictures don't line up with where I'm at, but that's the governor of South Carolina, Pickens. The, the Palmetto defenders were on watch. At daylight, with the re reinforcements hiding under the deck, they entered the channel. About two miles from Sumter, a shot was heard, and a cannonball arched across its bow. Then a second shot. The first shot in the war between the states was fired by a young citadel cadet named George E. Hainsworth of Sumter, South Carolina. Doubleday ran to the quarters of, and alarmed Anderson, then ordered all the men to their posts and prepared to return fire. McGowan and Woods aboard the Star, seeing that no return fire came from Sumter, changed course to leave the channel. Anderson collected all his officers and ordered no firing. Doubleday was enraged and demanded immediate action, but Meade who was opposed and proposed a letter to Governor Pickens to see if he had ordered the firing or if it was just an overzealous soldier. Pickens responded that the Union had breached an agreement to not reinforce Sumter and a shot was sent over her bow as a warning. The agreement was between Floyd and Pickens. It had nothing to do with anybody else. The president didn't know about it. Anderson didn't know about it. It was just Floyd the southern leading secretary of war who had an agreement with Pickens that not, he didn't want to alarm them. So he had, nothing was ever done with the president or Anderson. So they didn't know anything about it. So the, then, then the star returned to New York. The star of the west returned to New York, never entered the harbor. And the Brooklyn, who was sent two days later to meet with it and support it and fortify it to get it into the harbor, to get the supplies and have the guns there to with the gun, enough guns on that boat to take care of all four of the, or three of the other forts and all of the cannons that were there. They would have destroyed them all. There were so many guns on that boat. They never met up with the Star of the West. The Star of the West turned around and left and went back to New York. The Brooklyn got there, searched for the Star of the West, couldn't find it, and turned around and went back to New York as well. So the Navy and the Army didn't, get, didn't touch base very good, I guess, back then. All right, and then if the Brooklyn had been sent with the Star of the West, its 22 9-inch guns could have blasted defense at Fort Moultrie, Morris Island, and Fort Johnson, allowing the Star to get supplies and reinforce something. It could have been rebuilt and strengthened, and commerce would have been stopped in, into Charleston. Anderson, he was a south-leaning, believed in slavery, and did not want to fight against any of, any of the others that he has served with and or attended West Point with, but he believed he took an oath of office for his country and would not give in and surrender or evacuate the fort. Mississippi and Florida joined in, succeed, in seceding with Alabama and Georgia on January 10th to soon fall, so now you have five states seceded. In secrecy, Jefferson Davis met with senators from Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas to ask for secession calling for a convention at Montgomery, Alabama to form a confederacy no later than February 15th. Georgia seized Fort Pulaski, Mississippi seized the unfinished fort at Ship Island, and a wave of seizures began in the south, arsenals, forts, revenue cutters, custom houses. Uh, now, none of them were battles, none of them were fired, no, no shots were fired, they just took them over and told the Union people to leave. Now, Colonel Sam Colt, a Yankee firearms manufacturer, was shipping boatloads of guns south while he built a mansion in Hartford, Connecticut on the money he made on the south. A munitions manufacturer at Harvard Mills, Connecticut sold 300 pounds of powder to Governor Pickens. So the people in the north were sending money and powder and guns and helping the south. President Buchanan, Realizing that he was losing the country, got rid of Floyd and Trescott, Thompson and Thomas, all secretaries of the interior, the, the war, the, the secretary of war, secretary of state. He, he tried to hold off the war until Lincoln took over. This gave Pickens time to build up his forces. 
fortify the forts surrounding Sumter and with cannons and men. More of the Southern Democrats deserted him because he wouldn't, wouldn't do what they wanted. The press was against them, and public, all the public, public up north and down south was against them. A regiment of volunteers advanced on the United States Navy Yard at Pensacola. Union Lieutenant Adam Slemmer at Fort Barrancas, nearly spiked, he, he, that was nearby uh, Pensacola, he spiked all his guns and took his 46 men and 30 seamen to nearby Fort Pickens, named after the father of Governor Pickens. Um, that was on Santa Rosa, Rosa Island at Pensacola. Back in Sumter, Anderson's troops in a cold, damp January suffered from, the, uh, from no fresh food, poor living conditions, and low morale. To make things worse, the Carolini Carolinians had bolstered its cannons against Sumter, surrounding it with heavy guns and, and uh, four colonels who had experience using them. I think we have a, the next slide I hope. Is this, is this was when Major Anderson was leaving and going into Fort Sumter. This is a move of them going up into, the, into Sumter. Uh, next one after that. That's Jeremiah Black, uh, Secretary of State, who was also, and we lost everything. Go to the <coughs> next one. This is General Scott. General Scott was uh, an aide to Buchanan, and he was uh, on the fence. He didn't want to start a war. So he was uh, there to, I guess, pacify everybody and hopefully get them to not start a civil war. But he, he didn't really want to vacate the fort, but he also didn't want to reinforce the fort. Let's go to the next one. Uh, this is Wigfall. He was a southern. Um, he proposed kidnapping the president. Uh, he was he was the eyes and ears of uh, people down south while he was in Washington. He hated hated the North. Um, he wanted he he was just uh, very adamant that he didn't want anybody in the North to to take over anything in the South. That's what Fort Sumter looked like. That's, it's a pretty big monstrosity of a fort in the middle of a harbor. Um, this, I mean, you can see how huge it was. And these, all of these are gun ports in here and gun ports up here. And those are the roofs of the barracks up on top. And uh, I think, uh, oh, this is, uh, one of the other forts on the other side across the bay and another one on the other side across the bay that would be firing at them. It was a pretty monstrous, monstrous fort at the time. It was really well built and well defended, but you have to have the men to be able to defend it. And they only had 60 men. So let's see where I was. Uh, let's see. All right, so now we are at the, the point where, uh, da, 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 da. okay. Meanwhile, and meanwhile, Anderson repaired all of his guns. The men worked feverishly to make do with what they had with no intention of surrendering. They sewed shirts and sheets together to hold artillery charges. With Pickens' blessing, the women and children were allowed to leave the fort completely because they came back over to uh, Fort Sumter uh, to avoid harming them and should the fort come under fire. Senator William Henry Seward of New York, and I think we have a picture of him next, I hope. No, nope, that's the Sumter. Okay, this is, I'm gonna explain this a little bit. This is the shape of Fort Sumter. And you can see where Fort Sumter is situated in the middle of the channel. All those lines that you see coming into it are from gun positions firing on Fort Sumter. So you have the channel coming in from the ocean, coming in, the, Sump the Fort Sumter was there to protect shipping from coming into Charleston, which is up here. And uh, 
They had forts here, forts here, forts here. Those were the three other forts. Fort Moultrie is up here, Pickney Island and Johnson. Uh, those are the, the other forts. They refortified Johnson, they refortified Pickney, and they refortified Moultrie. They had hundreds and hundreds of cannons aimed at Fort Sumter. So you understand the situation that they were in in the middle of the harbor all alone by themselves with guns pointing at them from all different directions. Uh, all right, so Seward, he, he comes into the picture because of Lincoln. He was uh, actually uh, not defeated in the election, but he lost the, uh, at the convention to, to Lincoln. He lost the uh, support of the people at the convention and they all uh, backed Lincoln for president. So he, his, his idea was to get involved with Lincoln, so he, he, he stayed with them and backed them, and Lincoln gave him a position. So he uh, told everybody that he was going to run the government, that he was going to control Lincoln, that Lincoln didn't know anything, he was a backwoodsman, and that Seward from New York was a more uh, well-mannered, well-liked, well-known, and he was going to control Washington, and he was going to run the show. So he lost the nomination at the convention to Lincoln, said that sit and hold your temper until March 4th. That's when Lincoln would be not inaugurated, and he would take, be taking over. Trouble will soon be over when he ran the government, controlling Lincoln. I will try to save freedom and my country, he said. He said, Madman North on January 3rd, Madman North and Madman South are working to seize the government, a dissolution of the a dis dissolution of the Union by civil war. Now, third president comes into the picture now, ex-president John Tyler. He comes up from the South for a peace convention to talk to old Buck Buchanan and try to stave off the battles at Fort Sumter. Hearing that the Brooklyn had sailed, he thought all was in vain. Buchanan lied to him, telling him that she went on a mission of mercy and relief not connected to South Carolina. Tyler urged the removal of troops from Sumter. Buchanan stayed firm that Sumter belonged to the Union. Another looming problem was Fort Pickens in Florida. The U.S. men of war Sabine, St. Louis, and Macedonian had arrived and the Brooklyn, with a company of regulars under Captain Israel Vegdas, was on its way. Buchanan agreed not to reinforce Fort Pickens, but only to give it supplies. With Lincoln nearing his time to take office, an organization taking the cue from Masonry, I hate to say that, with a lot of Masons being members, including Jefferson Davis, and a lot of Northern Masons as well, was a large group called the Golden Knights of the Golden Circle. And I never heard about it until I was watching the History Channel the other night and they had a little topic about it. And a whole bunch of them were caught right down, not too far from here, down by Lancaster in Heidelberg. They met in an old barn down there. And the way they caught them, there was a young couple that snuck away and jumped up into the hayloft and they were just doing what young couples try to do when they're hiding from people in a hayloft. And they were up there overseeing a meeting of the Knights of the Golden Circle that was going on in the barn down below. So they reported, of course reported it the next day, and then they started watching this barn and then they ended up catching the people in the Knights of the Golden Circle. Later on in the war, the Knights of the Golden Circle had a plot to release all of the southern prisoners out in Chicago. This was back in 1863 or 4, later on in the war. So they were trying to do that. And Jefferson Davis was one of the members of the Knights of the Golden Circle. So I'm researching more about that. I'd like to do a program just on that if I can. Because I don't have, I, I don't have any memorabilia that I've ever purchased on the Knights of the Golden Circle. So I have to find something. Um, anyway, the... Uh, the Knights of the Golden Circle were uh, pretty much stopped by Alan Pinkerton. Pinkerton, everybody knows the name of the Pinkerton from uh, how he stopped the stagecoach robberies and everything else. And he had a lot to do with getting Lincoln into um, 
back into Washington. So I think there's a little bit in here. I wanted to read it about out of one of the books because it's a little bit more in depth. Um, all right, so we're down to the Knights of the Golden Circle. Uh, they plotted to kill Lincoln. And a man named Tom Harding, he plotted to blow up the stage that Lincoln would be sworn in on. But he was caught by Pinkerton and his men on the banks of the Potomac as he, after he crossed across the Potomac into Washington. Uh, a plot to kill Lincoln was on, uh, uh, to kill him while he was on his way to Washington. That was foiled by Pinkerton as well. And uh, they were, they put a cloak over his head and uh, he was supposed to be on a carriage and coming up and they, moved, Pinkerton got him onto a train and snuck him out of Baltimore and into Washington, D.C. Uh, Jefferson Davis was elected president of the Confederacy at their convention in Alabama and hopes of a peaceful transition. When he resigned from his post from uh, Senator of Mississippi in Washington, he stressed specifically that he did not want war, he was against war, and that he wanted a peaceful transition. He wanted the Confederacy to be separate from the Union, and he knew that it was illegal to be separate from the Union, but he wanted a peaceful transition. He did not want a war. Um, Okay, so now let's see. He stressed that, but gave, uh, but he was worried about Governor Pickens. He was always worried about his temper and what he was going to do. After telling Tyler of his aim to avoid bloodshed, Pickens did. He was planning his attack on Sumter. He wanted to attack while the Union troops were in Washington, protecting Lincoln's inauguration. At Charleston's dry dock, they constructed what. Uh, uh, construction was underway on a floating battery, 100 feet long by 25 feet wide, with four siege cannons so heavy that the other side had to be counterweighted with sandbags. Five big cannons uh, also arrived in Charleston Harbor from Tredegar Ironworks in Richmond, Virginia. I was there, so it's along the James River right alongside. If we go to the next slide, I'm hoping that the, the battery, the floating battery is on it. I hope I got at least that one right. Like the next one you mean? Yep. No, that's Seward. Okay, well we'll leave Seward up there so you see what okay. Seward. He was the guy that was going to take over for Lincoln. He was going to take over and run the presidency, run the country. Uh, he was the one from New York and he was going to uh, tell Lincoln how to run the country. There's the floating battleship. 100 feet long. It had iron on the bottom, wood, Cannons. They lived in it. They stayed in it. It was uh, 25 feet wide by 100 feet long. So, you know, it's a pretty big sized ship for back in the day. And that was the, what they pulled out in, in, from Charleston, came out to the backside. So it was behind Sumter. If Sumter was facing the ocean, it would have been on the backside of Sumter. Um, all right, so now. Three more were, uh, cannons were set up on Cummings Point, and uh, on March 1st, Pierre Beauregard, he was now a Brigadier General of the Confederacy, at one time he was in charge of West Point, and uh, he left West Point as soon as South Carolina seceded and went back down south. Um, he was to take charge of all of their artillery. He was, a he was a cadet at West Point under Major Anderson who was the Union uh, major in charge of something. Washington looked like, the city of Washington looked like a city under siege. Hope of an ass assassination attempt on Lincoln with the hope of seizing the government buildings. It, that caused all the women and children to leave the city. They all were flying it in droves, leave, fleeing the city because of the, the fear of what was gonna happen. The Capitol Police checked sewers, they had all, possible hiding places covered, snipers on the roofs of all buildings around the parade route and the platform. Soldiers were placed under and around the platform where Lincoln, the exchange of power was to take place. Nothing happened, thank God. The contrast between the elderly white-haired Buchanan and the tall, cold, black-haired, rugged-looking Lincoln suggested exhaustive energies of old were to be replaced by the vigorous strength of Lincoln's new administration. His first words were, no state upon its own mare 
motion can lawfully get out of the union. The power confided in me will be used to hold, occupy, and possess the property and places belonging to the government. We must not be enemies. Secretary of War Joseph Holt. I'm hoping he's there. No, that's Beauregard. I didn't, didn't even have him marked down here. He, he's the one that came down and took over all of the artillery. Now let's see if Holt's there. Maybe I'll get one right. There he is, Postmaster General Holt. Secretary, Postmaster, he received letters from Anderson and his men that Buchanan refused to address rather than to turn over to Lincoln. He, uh, Buchanan never got all of the letters that Anderson and his men sent them over to anybody on uh, Lincoln's. He finally gave them to Holt and Holt gave them to Lincoln. Um, the assumption that Lincoln was to surrender the fort known to his friends in the press and in the South, General Scott drafted a letter to Anderson to withdraw, but Lincoln refused to let it be sent. Headlines of the event of, summer, Sum, of Sumter determined in the newspapers that uh, Anderson was to go to Fort Monroe, leave Sumter. These were all going in the papers down south because they kept sending them down from Trescott and Floyd and everybody else, Thompson and all of the people, Ruffin and uh, all the people from the south that were still in Washington and uh, staying there just to get information down there. Meanwhile, Governor Pickens had been buying cannons and his army was now 8,835 men strong. April 3rd, Anderson wrote a letter to the new Secretary of War Cameron that his food was exhausted and he could only last four or five days. General Scott and Seward believed the fort should be evacuated. Postmaster General Montgomery Blair, which we seen earlier, he spoke out against it in favor of reinforcing the fort. He did not trust Scott or Seward. The next day, Lincoln sent notes to the Secretaries of War and the Navy that an expedition to move be sent to move by sea, be ready to sail as early as April 6th, and to be ready if needed to aid Anderson or help with an evacuation. Lincoln sent a ship under Captain Fox to first send a patrol boat of provisions to the fort, and if it were fired on, this is where he said it would be a, uh, fired on a boatload of bread. Uh, Robert Chu was sent from the State Department along with Captain Theodore Talbot. They were to deliver a message to Pickens about the delivery of food supplies. April 10th, Captain Fox sailed four days later and uh, on April 3rd, a shot was fired. Men in the ramparts in, for in Fort Sumter were amazed to see a little schooner. If you remember that picture of Fort Sumter and there was a little boat with sails on it, that was the schooner that they meant that came in flying the United States flag. Um, it came in out of the fog into the main ship channel. Anderson again summoned his officers on what were to be done. Five men were in favor of retaliating, three were opposed. Anderson cho chose the latter. Double Day again was outraged. Anderson sent a boat under a white flag to Morris Island to inquire if the firing, uh, to inquire of the firing. Colonel de Saint-Sur stated that he was under orders to fire any, on any ship flying the U.S. flag that attempts to reach the fort. The men then rode out to the schooner, interviewed the bewildered captain, Ma Master Joseph Hart, who simply got lost in the fog and was on his way to Savannah, Georgia. He had nothing to do with anything to do with the government, wasn't there to do anything, just happened to get lost and they fired a, a shot across his bow and he just turned around and left. So that was not any of the ships that were sent there. Andrew Pro Anderson protested to Pickens, who agreed that the firing should never have happened. Anderson started preparing for the worst. The men were given one cracker in the morning and one cracker in the evening. Cameron sent notice that the expedition should arrive with supplies by the 11th or 12th of April. So now they're waiting on, on food to come. Captain Foster, who was the second guy that showed up down there to, to fortify the fort, he shored up the walls with old gun carriages. He took, they knocked off old, the old cannon carriages, fortified the walls even higher, and added more masonry to it to, to build up the walls. Um, Beauregard received his orders to demand evacuation of Sumter or he would reduce it. 
He had 5,000 more soldiers arriving. The floating battery was now towed out to the west end of Sullivan Island, out in, towards the channel, so we had a better line. Its guns cutting off any ships that were to come in from anywhere on the backside, adding firepower against the fort. On April 12th, at 12.45 p.m., that's in early in the morning, a boat under a white flag was approaching Sumter. Three aides got out with a dispatch from Beauregard asking Anderson would he be, when he would be forced by starvation to evacuate. Anderson again called all his officers, asking them what they thought. Dr. Crawford, who was the first guy that was sent down there, he was a doctor, but he actually ended up fighting, doing a lot of the fighting. He said four or five days at the most is all they could hold out without starving the men to death. Anderson delayed telling all of these, telling this to the aides, hoping that he could hold out until daylight to see if a ship came into the harbor. Uh, about 3.30, um, he couldn't hold out anymore because he was pressured by the aides to give him an answer. His answer, his reply was, you fired on my flag twice. If you do it again, I will open fire. The officers then, from his crew, then told him, we can hold out till the 15th. So they went back and they told Beauregard. Beauregard gave them until 4.30 in the morning, so one hour. They went over to the mortar battery and they told Captain George James to fire a signal shot at precisely at 4.30. Anderson, meanwhile, went back, ordered his men to return to the quarters and not fire a shot until daylight. At 4.30, a shot rang out and blasted open above Fort Sumter like a fireworks. Many said that it was in the shape of a palmetto, the, the, the tree of South Carolina. All hell broke loose and cannons fired from every direction. <clears throat> One shot hit just above Abner Doubleday's head, but his hatred for the South kept him from getting out of bed. He said, they're not gonna, they're not gonna rile me up. He's gonna stay right there. So he never even moved. Um, <clears throat> Reveille was uh, held at 6 a.m. Roll call was done as usual. Breakfast of fat pork and water as shells expl exploded all around them. Anderson orders the men under the, the casements. The casements were uh, the arch, the big arch, concrete archways that where the cannons were, so they were more well protected because everything above them was quite high and they were in the lower casements. They didn't, they weren't in the upper casements. Um, let's see where that was. Uh, all right, he told them not to fire the cannons on the upper ramparts. Be careful of yourselves, men. <clears throat> Anderson gave Doubleday the permission of firing the first shot. He felt the United States was called upon not only to defend its sovereignty, but its right to exist as a nation. Just short of 7 a.m., he fired a 32 pounder. Now this is, to me, was funny. Its shot hit the slanted T-roof, T-rail roof of the iron battery at Fort Moultrie and bounced off of, as if it was one of Doubleday's baseballs. <laughs> so they really didn't do anything at all. Um, <clears throat> All right, so then, then his, his shots bounced off, and uh, he asked to switch to shooting right at Fort Moultrie, and Anderson agreed. Private John Connery of H Company, he disobeyed all the orders of Anderson, climbed up on the ramparts, and one by one fired every cannon on the upper deck by himself. He was not supposed to do that, but the only reason he stopped doing it was because he could no longer reload the cannons by himself. He needed two people and three people to reload the cannons and fire them. Two sergeants saw what he had done, so they snuck up on the other side and also fired 10-inch uh, guns on the other side. Well, one of them actually, when they fired it, bounced off the rampart and fell backwards, but it fired. Uh, Confederates shelled, continued to shell their barracks into a total wreckage. Four men were wounded went by splittering brick and masonry. Uh, no, no casualties as of this point. Um, 
Sumter started the day with 700 cartridge bags. Now they were reduced to only firing two guns at a time. Double A looked out towards Charleston and saw all the people lined up. Let's see if I have that picture. I'm hoping. No, that's the picture of Seaward. All right, so we're now back to, this is Seaward over here in a cartoon, and this is Lincoln over here balancing Peace, the dove on this side, and Fort Sumter with the flag on this side on his head. So that's a cartoon that was in the newspaper. I could see that in the Scranton Times. They would do that. They'd make it look nastier, though. Um, all right, so let's see. All right, so we're at where Doubleday decided to fire a ca cannon. So let's see if that goes to the next one. Uh, get him out of there, too. Blair, we already had. There's Doubleday. That's what Abner Doubleday looked like. That's the guy that uh, invented the, not baseball, but the diamond that baseball was played on and the rules for the game of baseball. Abner Doubleday. So that's what he looked like. He was a very intense person and very, he, he really wanted to fight. He, he wanted, didn't want to just sit there and do nothing. So at this time, he looked out towards Charleston and saw all the people lined up watching. Let's see if the next slide goes to the people watching. There it is. No, that's not it either. All right. I got none of them in the right order. Okay, so this is what the inside of the Fort Sumter looked like. So you see the cannons up top and the cannons down the bottom. And then these are mortars that are in the center and the big cannonballs. And I do have pictures, if you ever get a chance to go down south, go to Richmond, Virginia, to the uh, Museum of the Confederacy in Richmond. It's a small white building, it's a beautiful museum. And they have some of the big cannonballs there and some of the shells that would have been fired from these cannons. Uh, it's probably one of the best museums I've seen. They have actually have the saddle, sword, and gloves of Robert E. Lee, the actual ones, not fake ones like you see in some museums. Uh, they have original flags, uh, the stars and bars, and the original Confederate flag before the stars and bars that were there um, for, with the round circle of stars. They have so much in there that's all original swords and guns and pistols and boots and, and canteens and everything. It's a great place to see. All right, so anyway, we're, we're to, to where uh, he's, let's see if the next one goes to the, the city. Of Charleston. Oh, there it is. There you see the fort way out there, and then the firing the, over here and over here, firing onto the fort, and all the men <coughs> and ladies on top of the roofs of the buildings looking out, watching this battle going on. So Doubleday looks out and he sees all this. He sees thousands of people lined up and cheering, and, and uh, troops standing there doing nothing because they all had the rifles. So, so you see nothing there. So he decides, well, I'm going to do something about this. So he turns his cannon, and he decides he's going to send it over to Hotel Moultrie, where he st said he stayed and had a bad bed, didn't have a good bed and didn't enjoy his stay there. So he decided he was going to fire upon it. So he fired into the second story of Fort Moultrie uh, Hotel, and he sent people scurrying in every direction. And he just laughed and smiled and said it was a small victory for the Union. Um, so early in the afternoon, a shout went up that ships were seen in the, in the, over the bar. Two ships flying the U.S. flag. This invigorated everyone, the workers, even the workers and the band members started loading cannons and sewing cartridge bags and by midnight, uh, the re no relief boat came. It, they just stayed out in the harbor. No boats rode in, no, no supplies, no nothing. So Anderson's men slept. Gustavus Fox, let's see if he comes up maybe, maybe he'll come up in the next picture. We're almost done. That's upside down, but that's him. I could look at him this way, that's him. So let's take him out of there and we'll see what the next one is. Um, he was 10 miles outside of Charleston. He had a five gun paddle wheeler and it was the only boat there. He was waiting on the Pohatan, the Pocahontas, and the Pawnee and three tugboats. So they were all supposed to have been sent at the same time to reinforce the fort and supply the fort. Um, 
Seaward had taken the Poetan from Fox and kept it back in New York. Uh, one of the tugboats was driven by a storm into North Carolina and never made it. The Yankee went right past Charleston and ended up in Savannah, Georgia. The third tugboat never left New York. All of them should have been there and they weren't. So all he could do was wait for the ships and they never came. At six o'clock, the Pawnee finally arrived. Fox boarded it and ordered the captain to head in. The commander, Rowan, refused, stating that his orders were to wait, to wait for the Poetan. Fox left him and went in with the Baltic and the Harriet Lane with the two small little ships. As he approached, he heard the firing and decided not to go in without any man of war to back him because he had no cannon, just, the, just what was on that paddle wheel. At daybreak, no ships had arrived. Anderson's uh, men continued to fire only on Fort Moultrie now. They couldn't fire anywhere else. And it was the first battle on record between two forts. Anderson did not know that his brother-in-law was firing at him from Fort Moultrie. And that happened a lot in the battle between relatives firing at each other without knowing about, about it. The heavy rain lasted until around eight o'clock in the morning. Firing continued on the fort, igniting fires in the barracks and around the magazine. The magazine was loaded with gunpowder. They rolled out about 45 barrels out of the, the magazine, hoping that it wouldn't blow up, because if it blew up, it would probably kill everyone in the, in the fort. Um, they were reduced to firing now only one cannon every 10 minutes. Soon the powder started to explode. A shell hit the flagstaff, knocking it down. Lieutenant Paul braved the heat and smoke to rescue it, put out the burning flag. Three men helped him reposition it to a post and rigged it back up and put the flag back up. Uh, oh, they're almost out of cartridges now. Now you're at April 13th at 1.30 p.m. Finally, Major Anderson lowers the flag and puts up a hospital sheet. The battle was over. The only casualty of the battle was a horse, killed by a shot from Fort Sumter. Um, now the men had been there 15 weeks, 33 hours under fire, and were now to go home. Double Day was not happy because he found out there were no casualties on the Confederate side. He said, what kind of a war was that? We couldn't even inflict any damage on them. Horace Greeley later said that it was the it was a comparatively bloodless beginning to the bloodiest war in America. Um, the Confederates could have marched in and taken the fort at any time had they known that there was only 61 fighting men and uh, a hapless navy, cannons that could not inflict damage on any of the posts. They, none of the cannons could reach any place except for Moultrie. Would do any, all they did was bounce off everything that they hit. Um, thousands of troops and civilians lined up to watch the surrender of the fort. Uh, let's see if that next picture comes up. I'm hoping maybe. Those are all of Anderson's men. Um, you see, you've got Anderson, Doubleday, Anderson, Crawford, Foster, Seymour, Snyder, Davis, the uh, places where all this this book is all factual. There, this is nothing is made up in this book, and it, it lists all the newspapers where he got all the information. It lists all the people that he that he talked to, that had relatives that were there, and letters that they wrote, and it, and everything is genuine. Everything that you've seen on the on this and heard from this was actually what happened at the Battle of Fort Sumter. Uh, there was a lot more course but it takes too much to put it into a program but this book it, this book and every Civil War book I have will be available when our museum is open we're going to have probably one of the the nicest uh, libraries on Civil War Revolutionary War World War two World War one uh, the history of German history of Lackawanna Valley we have we have a I'm a big collector and so is Cody so a lot of, every, almost everything I have is going to be in that library and we keep acquiring more and more so 
Um, with, when that museum is open, which I'm hoping to see by early summer at the latest, um, you'll be able to come in there and take out, or even sit, because we're going to have rooms with lamps behind you where you could sit and read, uh, be open during the day, and maybe into the evening, eight or nine o'clock, where you could sit there and read. Uh, there'll be desks there with computers where you could do research, and that's our goal. That's why we're doing these lecture series, to get more people to see what we're doing and to uh, hopefully join in with us. I'd like to combine with Mayfield and have more stuff on Mayfield in the museum and have more interest from people in Mayfield as well because we have a building, you know, so we have the place to have a, you know, we're going to have a small kitchen in there, we have handicapped bathrooms in there, uh, be a perfect place for meetings and meeting rooms and, and a little get-togethers and we'll hopefully we'll get some children to come there after school and do their homework or, or at least look and see what's going on and learn a little bit. So that's the reason that we do these lecture series. So. Thank you all for coming.